I'll introduce them all in turn as, as they speak. And I'm going to begin with freelance writer Amy Gray. And Amy, I, I wanted to begin with you, and, and you wrote about this very engagingly about a week ago. Your, your personal stories, I think, are sort of a story of our times. It shows that poverty is a broad church and that, that that line between comfort and certainty is pretty thin and that the that consequence of falling below that line is a sort of a desperate struggle to get by it's a fine line and for you that started with a sort of fairly optimistic choice to take a voluntary redundancy that's right i uh, i had worked for yeah. over 10 years in digital publishing and I took a small redundancy payout to try and make my way as a freelance writer. And the joke is amongst many writers, you're only ever one broken leg away from absolute destitution. It's a black humour, but it's actually very true. Uh, so it very quickly became apparent as uh, certain market forces changed that also my ability to provide also changed and lessened. And from that, I have discovered what it is like to be incredibly poor, what it is like to go hungry, what it is like to negotiate with people over bills or go without the gas, that sort of thing. And it's a new reality, but what's been quite interesting for me has been the reaction to poverty. And whilst there are many different expressions of poverty within Australia, there seems to be a fairly narrow reaction towards poverty, which I have found to be rather hostile. Des well, uh, describe that in more detail, that reaction. There's an interesting kind of um, agitation that people have when they discover that you're poor. And so it's almost an unwillingness to discuss it. There's an unwillingness to hear the uh, experiences of people who go through poverty. Instead, there's an immediate jump to, well, why don't you get a job? Well, even despite having 10 years of experience, I have actually been applying for work regularly. I can't find work. I can occasionally find contract work, but that's not sustainable. Plus, they also don't think, they also think, go for any job. Any job you can find, no matter what it is. Why, if you really care about your child or if you really care about living well, go take a cleaning job. Things like that that are actually not very reasonable or take into consideration what's happening in a person's life. Dr Shelley Mallett, if I can turn to you, and, and Shelley Mallett is, is General Manager of Research and Policy at the Brotherhood of St Lawrence. She's also a Professorial Fellow in Social Policy at the University of Melbourne. How typical is that? sort of experience we hear from Amy and I wonder how much that sort of experience is, is a consequence of the changing world of work. What we know about young people is that uh, they really want to work, um, that they uh, that, and like the government, like the welfare agencies, etc., they really want to work. Um, but there's a significant number of them now who are really finding it's uh, a struggle in the modern economy to, to find a job. Some of them, um, in particular, that we see through the Brotherhood of St Lawrence and other welfare agencies, have um, had a pretty rough time. They're um, exiting homelessness service or they're, they're, um, they might be in out-of-home care, child protection, they might be um, exiting the justice system. And some of these young people actually haven't, haven't acquired the skills that um, other young people might get. And so they really struggle um, to actually make a way, a, a way forward. And uh, part of their struggle is what Amy suggests. That, that people have a kind of reflex prejudice to them. And what we know from almost uh, all of the research that we do with young people is that they really, really aspire to work. They aspire to have those things that um, the mainstream want, a job, a house, um, a reasonable income, and a sense of belonging, and, and a sense that they're valued by the community. David, to bring you in here, Dr David Morowitz, he's, he's an economist, a psychologist, uh, a philanthropist and co-author of a, a report released this week, and it's called in Advanced Australia Fair, what to do about growing inequality in Australia. And that sense of inequality is a really interesting talking point uh, just now. You've, you've co-authored that report. What are the, I mean, the link on the surface is reasonably obvious between a growing discrepancy between rich and poor, but perhaps dig into that a little bit for us and give us a sense of whether that gap is a growing thing. That gap is indeed growing. We, uh, the gap for Australia uh, in inequality is growing second only to the United States. 
Uh, one of the things that Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz points out is that inequality is a choice. That we can choose to have a more equal society, we can choose to have a less equal society. Um, we say we don't have enough money to uh, help poor people or to give them better education or better early childhood education. But over the last decade, uh, tax revenues have fallen from 26% of GDP to 23% while spending has stayed about the same at 25 percent. So all we need to do, for starters, is to raise tax revenue back to what it was. Now in the last seven years, the income tax cuts that we've had, the benefits to the top 10 percent have been greater than the benefits to the bottom 80 percent combined. Sinclair Davidson and Sinclair is, is an economist uh, from the RMIT School of Economics, Finance, and marketing, that sense of, of discrepancy, does growth in the economy actually work to alleviate poverty or does it just make the rich richer? And is poverty a, a sign of market failure? I, I would say that you would normally expect economic growth to promote poverty alleviation, but not necessarily um, undermine inequality because in my thinking, I very strictly differentiate between what is poverty and what is inequality. Inequality is something that I don't worry about too much. Poverty, on the other hand, is something that we should worry about. The problem being is that we've also voluntarily built in structures which make it harder for people who fall into poverty to get out of poverty. So we have all these labor market regulations which make it harder to produce jobs. We have situations whereby we have a discrepancy between the dole and the minimum wage. Now, if we were thinking innovatively about getting people into work, we would say something like, well, if you're on the dole and you get a job, any job, you can keep the money from the job and the doll and not be sort of um, priced out of the market in that way. So there's a lot of very innovative things that we can do at the bottom, which we are reluctant to do because we have these ideas that by regulating we can make the world a better place as opposed to by allowing people to work for themselves, they're going to be making the world a better place. Janine Evans, to bring you in too, she's Janine is Manager of Crisis and, and Homelessness Services at Wesley Mission in Victoria and you're pretty much at the, the cutting edge on the on, yeah, on the ground the here, in the, indeed. How does this sort of discussion ring to you? Um, does this this sense of possibility filter through at the coalface or is, is the sense at the coalface of intractability that people are stuck in that position? I mean, Amy's story certainly, you know, is one that's very common. It's about people, people are really trying they're really trying and they want to participate but I think in order to participate you actually need to be able to assist people so at the moment the way it seems is that we're punishing people so in punishing people it makes it twice as hard so when you find yourself in a position of disadvantage it is ten times harder to get back up and to be able to you know we're actually people who experience homelessness or experience poverty end up with so many other problems so they end up with mental health issues and long-term issues and once you get to that point it makes it really difficult for people to even participate in the economy. And, and Tim Hanson from Victoria Police, Superintendent Tim Hanson, I think it's a good point to bring you in there because I, I'm, I'm curious as to how much of police load can in some way be related to disadvantage. Um, how much disadvantage tends to act out in antisocial behaviour potentially? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, really good point. We're, we've done a lot of research on what drives crime and, and we identify that there's predominantly two main causes of the drivers of crime, that being alcohol and drugs. But there's actually an, an emerging theory that there's a third driver of crime and that's what we call uh, community marginalisation or social exclusion. And, and there we're looking at issues of what we're talking about here, homelessness, um, unemployment, uh, no contact to um, judicial services or to health services and so we're really working quite strongly with our partners both across government and across the whole community um, to make sure that everyone's lifting the load there and, and making sure that the gaps that are presently in the system are closed down as quickly as they can because we understand the earlier we intervene in this process then the, the better judicial outcomes we have. Michaela Cronin and Michaela is the Australian Council of Social Service Deputy President and the CEO of McKillop Family Services. Michaela, you had your ACOS conference this week um, at, at which and, and we invited Social Services Minister Kevin Andrews to take part in this discussion this morning but he declined. He spoke at your conference however and he 
made a rather a memorable ob observation that welfare denied the opportunity for people to be virtuous. Is there almost a sort of a moral dimension to some of this discussion, in particular some of the policy changes we're seeing? I think, Jonathan, that that would be very much what the experience of the community sector in terms of what, what the evidence is about what helps people get a job, live a, live a meaningful life, um, the sorts of programs that, that our agencies deliver that, that enable people to, as Shelley's talked about, do, do what most people actually really want to do, which is to, to belong and have a sense that they're contributing to society. And that the, the, what, what seems to be the, the logic behind this, this budget um, seems to be quite counter to that. So, so the sorts of programs that enable people to contribute to society um, and to achieve the life that they want are actually being cut. Um, so it's not, it's not a budget that the, the logic behind seems to be that, that we will enable people to contribute and, and, and belong to society. I think that you're right in terms of the moral it, it seems to be ideologically driven rather than evidence-based in terms of what we know works to address issues of poverty. We're talking about poverty, a special Sunday Extra Forum, um, a cast of thousands here this morning. Janine Evans, you were looking up meaningfully as, as Michaela was speaking there. I mean, I guess we've got concerns as a material aid provider. We've seen a 47% increase in people seeking assistance for material aid and a bit like Amy, we're seeing a lot of people like Amy who have never accessed our services in the past. So we've already seen a huge increase over the last three years and I'm concerned that when we cut things like some of the programs that we already run to assist people to be able to, we, we need to be able to hold people to get them back into society to be able to do and participate. We really need to get back to basics and I think what Michaela was saying, it's sort of counterintuitive to what's happening, is that if we don't invest in the very basics, which is just having food and shelter, then how do we expect people to participate? Because the focus is on economic participation. Shelley Mellon? Yeah, look, I think, um, I think the thing that's important to say is that there's some point of agreement with, with the government and the, and the minister uh, in terms of, of living, a, living a good life, a purposeful life. Um, I think we're, in fact, you know, we'd all be agreed that that's a very People want that outcome. People want that outcome. Um, and uh, no matter who you speak to, single parents, uh, young people, older people um, uh, that we see in our services. I think the point of disagreement really is how you achieve that. And I guess what some of the th uh, fellow panellists are saying is that actually, um, uh, particularly in the welfare sector, also with the police, we actually have some good models that have been tried and tested about how to achieve it. And um, what, what we seem to be overlooking is that, that real clear evidence. Um, I think um, we, we also might be agreed that we can have expectations of people to participate. Um, so that I don't even know that that's entirely con contentious. Uh, what we um, need to say is, well, how do we assist people to meet those expectations? I, I wonder, Sinclair Davidson, how much of this is a struggle to get the balance right. Um, you know, we want the economy to perform, we want boats to rise with that economy, and yet there's clearly a necessity to, to fund the services and the programs that assist people to, to get engaged. Yes, I, I think that's entirely true because we, we all believe that a growing economy raises all boats and that once we've become rich we can share. I think that is uh, certainly the, the underlying principle which I suspect most people would agree with. But to, to take it back a step um, and perhaps to put the cats amongst the pigeons, is um, a definitional issue. Um, what is poverty? Now, I think everybody in this room has an idea that poverty is half of the median wage type affair, some sort of definition like that. I don't know that a lot of people actually like the idea of a measure of relative poverty as to a measure of absolute poverty. And I think a, a, a lot of the hostility which Amy talks about comes from the fact that there seems to be a perception amongst the people who are working a month a year, as Mr. Hockey tells us, that poverty could be anything from being homeless, which I think we can all agree is poverty, to only having one plasma television. Now, I think that is a perception. Now, that may be an unfair perception, an untrue perception, but I think if we want to get serious about dealing with, 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 with po issues of poverty, we need to unravel poverty from inequality.
and we need to actually come up with a definition where a lot of people can agree these are the individuals that we're helping because when we hear statistics that say almost half of the population receives a payment from the government in some form or another we might then think well our welfare system is not well targeted now I've done a back of the envelope calculation that this financial year this coming financial year we're going to be spending 146 billion dollars on welfare if we believe that there are two and a half million people living in poverty in Australia we could send each and every single one of them a check for over fifty thousand dollars each fifty thousand dollars each Maybe to alleviate their poverty. Maybe that's a plan. And well, the, <laughs> no, that is not a plan actually, because <laughs> what is really happening is that we are spreading our money far and wide. And I think we need to think carefully about who we are targeting, why we are targeting them, how much money they are getting, and actually develop a, a greater sense of community involvement and understanding. Okay. A Amy Gray, what's your sense of, of that definitional issue? What is poverty? It's very interesting to me when we think about uh, this in terms of uh, relative poverty as opposed to extreme or absolute uh, because we are in a country where we were all raised to believe that we're Aussie battlers and that was very much part of the curriculum especially under the Howard government where everyone now thinks that they're a battler so therefore there's a certain resentment to then consider, well, why would I pay a month of my yearly wages to help someone else? Because I think that there's an absolute uh, discrepancy in judging, you know, what the definition is of poverty. And, and David Moravitz, the, the point that Sinclair makes too about all boats rising, is that your sense? I mean, and around this discussion of inequality, that's sort of one of the foundation issues, that an economy can grow and yet not pick up the people at the bottom of that, that on those lower rungs. Some people change that uh, phrase about all boats rising these days to all boats rise, except when you've got an anchor that's holding you back, uh, which is very often the case. In terms of in which absolute... Case I suspect you might drown. Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of absolute poverty, uh, the unemployment benefit, the new start unemployment benefit at the moment is $36 a day. That's for housing, for clothing, for food, for applying for jobs, for all the rest of it. Um, that's 20% below the poverty line. Uh, the poverty line in 2010, $752 a week for a couple with two kids. If you divide that by four, that's $27 per person per day. Uh, that's the poverty line. So it's hard for me to believe that that's not poverty. Uh, and there are, as you pointed out, something like I forget the number, but maybe two million people who are living below the poverty line. Um, just to give a, a, an anecdotal example, a friend of mine is the, the principal of an inner suburban high school. Uh, he gets kids coming, he says, I cry. He gets kids coming to prep uh, who are from uh, high functioning families, they're fine, they're ready to start school. He gets kids coming to prep from dysfunctional families where they've been neglected, where they've been sat in front of television for most of their five years. Uh, he says they're three years behind and they just it's so hard to get them to catch up and once you are way behind it's real hard to catch up they're the ones they're some of the ones who have the anchor Sunday extra here on RN and we, we're talking with a with a, a large panel on the issue of poverty and, and particularly on that issue that David Morowitz raises just there about whether poverty becomes almost a, a fixed state uh, superintendent Tim Hansen Victoria police I'm not asking you to be political here, um, but when you hear an announcement like there will be no dole for young people for periods of six months at a time, what sort of responses does that strike from a, a, a police force? What sort of problems do you anticipate from a situation like that? Policing is a really uh, complex environment, so there is a whole lot of uh, inputs that go into it. But as I say, disadvantages is certainly one of those. And it's, it's so straight away when we hear that those sort of announcements, we're working quite actively with our partners and our stakeholders and back with community. And, and we have a really strong focus on making sure the communities are as resilient as possible. So obviously in austere times, that's a really difficult sort of task to achieve. Um, everyone's feeling the pinch, as I say, not only just from a policing perspective, but if I put my community board member hat on, you know, I know in our own agency we're feeling the pinch. So from our perspective within VicPol, it's, it's about us trying to work smarter with our stakeholders and also about having 
a bigger focus on prevention rather than just traditionally us being about re um, reactive sort of enforcement strategies. Uh, Michaela Cronin, I mean, that, that sense of, of, I guess, resource, and, uh, and a lot of people were a bit taken aback by the, the announcement from, from Senate estimates post the budget that the government was making such a large allowance for uh, crisis um, crisis measures as a result of the things that it was announcing in the budget, 550,000 potential uh, emergency applications for aid is a thing that the government is anticipating. Um, I guess you'd have a sense that that's realistic. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think that the experience of agencies um, across the country is that when changes like this happen, there is an increased demand for pressure, as Janine talked about, in terms of material aid. If you have to make a choice, if you're on $36 a day and you have to make a choice about whether you're going to take your child to the hospital or to the doctor, whether you're going to pay... Um, one of the issues that a lot of our agencies face is people who are struggling with homelessness, mental health issues, often don't pay... Um, pay for tickets on public transport, they then get fines. They then into this vicious cycle of having huge fines that are, that are weighing on them. Um, and then there's all sorts of issues around the um, engagement with, with, um, with the criminal justice system. And it's, an, it's a cycle that's very difficult to get out of. And I think one of the, the dichotomies in terms of the way people are being described, there's a lot of pitting people against each other. Either you're a lifter in the budget and you're contributing and you're paying your months out of your salary um, a year, or you're a you're a you're you're, you're a leaner. I you're think. a leaner. You're a lifter, or you're a leaner, um, and and you're the recipient of charity. Uh, Shelley Mallet, that that sort of rhetoric, the the lifter, leaner, um, earn or learn, these these dichotomies that apparently people can confront and make the choice, is is that an accurate representation of experience? Um, I think um, earn or learn. I mean, in some ways. Um, who would disagree with it? If you just take young people, um, who would disagree that part of their transition into adulthood is, is um, um, either being in education or, or getting a job? Um, I think um, what, what people might disagree with, though, is um, the, the understanding, a, a kind of punitive interpretation of that. Um, and uh, we certainly at the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, you know, think earn or learn, it's, it's got real potential. Um, but we want to equip people to earn or learn. That's the, that's the significant difference. So I think, um, and it's not just young people. Um, I think uh, other people, you know, I've, I've certainly done research with uh, single parents, for example. And what you find, about, find out about single parents is that they go to the utmost lengths to um, ensure that their children are in school or that they're, they're in a good house. Um, I think um, that, that assumption that people don't want to be doing those things is completely um, a, a false assumption and, and we don't need to pit uh, each other against one another uh, in saying that there's this subclass of people who are, who are lazy and don't want to get on with it. Untrue, totally untrue. Sinclair Davidson, we're, we're a tremendously wealthy country. We're one of the best performing economies in the world. Yeah. How can the sort of experiences that we're hearing about actually exist? I think the um, one of the things that, are, that, that I'm hearing in, in the discussion is that there is a, a, a deserving poor, people who through no fault of their own find themselves um, in poverty. And uh, there then seems to be some sort of overlap with people who receive government welfare for no good apparent reason. Um, so we, we, we need to think about that. We also need to bear in mind that in a society there are always going to be people who, through mental illness, drug and alcohol abuse, various reasons, um, end up in assistance, in, in need of assistance. And I don't think anybody really begrudges that. What they do begrudge is the, the, the leaner argument. Now, uh, uh, picking up on Amy's point uh, uh, again, is that I suspect most people in, in Australia are, are not going to think that they are leaners. Most people are going to think that they are, are, are lifters. Whereas in actual fact, we have a huge overlap of the welfare system with people who don't really need that money. We saw this massive growth during the Howard era of, of money just being splashed around all over the place. And uh, 10 years down the track, we realize we can't really afford this. David Morowitz, a wealthy country that nonetheless has extreme poverty. Um, that seems a disconnection. 
Absolutely. Uh, do we want a country in which children who happen to be born into poor families have the same life chances as children who happen to be born in rich families? Uh, secondly, we have so many myths in this country around this area. One is that our welfare system is not well targeted. It is one of the most targeted systems in the OECD, bar none, right down in the bottom in terms of how much we spend on welfare in the OECD. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the, whether it's becoming entrenched, whether we're getting an entrenched underclass, uh, there's a new concept called the Great Gatsby Curve, uh, where they look at uh, the income, they've done it with fathers and sons because it's easier to uh, check uh, because of the surnames following down the generations. So uh, the incomes of the fathers and the incomes of the sons. In more equal societies like Denmark, if the father is well above the average, the son is about 15% above the average. If the, in the United States, if the father is above the average, the son is about 50% above the average. So we're moving in the United States direction where if your parents are rich, you're probably going to be rich. If your parents are poor, you're probably going to be poor. Do we want to actually be there? Is that what we want? It is a choice. Amy Gray, to, to, to end as we began, I mean, what, what helps here? What gets you out of this position? What, what changes the situation? I'm actually not sure, um, because for me, I'm a single parent. I'm actually more petrified of what's going to happen in 10 to 20 years for my daughter. Um, how do I, in the next couple of years, move to a suburb that has a high school so that she can get education? And then, how is she going to be able to economically thrive enough to be able to access tertiary education? And she's a gifted student, and so it's most likely that she will want to pursue higher education. How is she actually going to have the economic ability to be able to sustain those costs, not only in the immediate future, but in the longer term future? And how is she going to be able to move on from the position that she's currently in with me? I don't know what's actually going to make things better because right now it doesn't really, there doesn't seem to be a whole heap of light. Um, equality of services would be fantastic. An actual equality of opportunity would be manna from heaven because what I'm seeing right now is not equality of opportunity. It seems to be just yet another series of anchors. What you've just heard is a, a, a slightly edited version of this conversation. There's a longer one waiting for you online. Uh, just search for Sunday Extra on iTunes or head to the RN website and the Sunday Extra program page and join the conversation about this too. It's something which stirs passions and I hope it stirred thoughts for you as well. Let them, let them go on Twitter. Join that chat. Um, our handle is at RN Sunday Extra. Use the hashtag ABCRN. OK. So, uh, hockey expects 500,000 Australians to require emergency assistance as a result of his no dole for under 30 year olds. That's why they've set aside a quarter of a billion dollars for emergency assistance for the people he's going to pitch into poverty. My personal advice to anybody under 30 who is facing destitution and starvation is that if you find yourself faced with a choice between death by starvation or turning to a life of crime, target liberal voters, target national voters. Leave the Labor Party and the Greens and the Palmerites alone because it's the liberal national voters who put Hockey and Abbott and Brandis and Kemp and Hunt and Morrison Bishop et al. into power and they don't want to share. They've forgotten the fact that the dole was invented to prevent the poor from killing the rich. Warbles on the lot to YouTube. This is getting serious. Ciao.